joining us now for the At the Table political panel, the Chicago Sun-Times chief political writer, Tina Svondelis, Dave McKinney, the politics and government reporter for WBEZ, Ron Holmes, a Democratic political strategist who also has a private consulting company, and joining us for the first time, and a big welcome to Eleni Demersis, who is a former Republican communication strategist for former Republican House leader Jim Durkin, and also was a communications director for the Richard Irvin campaign for governor. She now is also with a private public affairs firm. So much to talk about Springfield, Chicago, big goings on. Let's start with what's happening right now in Springfield, where the big story is what will happen to the gun bill that is now pending before the supermajority Democratic House, Democratic Senate. So, Tina, you've been following this closely. We're speaking as there's a second hearing today. Uh, what's the state of play? What are the sticking points? And if we have supermajority Democrats, this isn't Washington that I cover. What's the problem? So far, we're not seeing a huge problem. Um, I do think that political headwinds are in favor of this bill passing. There could be some other changes because this is a Democratic, a House Democratic bill. Um, the Senate needs to do what it needs to do. They might tinker with things. Um, I have been noticing some of the supportive statements from different gun groups. They're very broad, but we don't really know particularly if they want other things, if they want a little bit more. Um, and so they're letting it go through the process. Democrats introduced this about two weeks ago. We, you know, we thought it would come a little bit earlier this year, but obviously uh, they waited until after the election. Um, so things are looking good for it. This is the typical process. And we're in uh, the second of third hearings right now as we speak. There's a hearing and there's another one on Tuesday. We have not heard any of these, uh, the pro-gun people, the pro-Second Amendment people yet. So we're anticipating a big show, whatever that is, whenever they want to say what they want to say. We have not seen that yet. The first hearing was on um, Tuesday, I believe. And that was a lot of um, gun victim survivors, including a Highland Parks uh, surviving victim. So what is the provision in the legislation that might do the most impact to diminish the gun violence that is chronic in Chicago as well as in other places in the state? This is a good question. I do think that um, some of these assault weapons or some of these types of weapons that are out there that people believe should not be out in the streets, that they believe should be used by the military, um, the clips, they are clips that are added onto a gun that allow people to shoot rapidly. Um, people believe that that is a contributing factor to gun violence in Chicago, to these mass shootings that we've seen. We had a Halloween shooting where uh, 15 people were shot including three kids in East Garfield Park. So we're seeing more and more of these. So they're trying to stem the flow of these, you know, rapid fire guns that just, you know, a couple of shots can kill multiple people. So they find that to be hugely dangerous. So what's the strategy here? Uh, before I turn to the others, Tina, a, a vote in two weeks ago. I mean, is it, do you think yes, the vote will absolutely happen in the lame duck or it, will it be kicked over to the new session? Uh, well, the, the voting threshold is lower starting January 1st. It, 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 it would be it's it seems like it's going to happen. I think they need 60 votes. Um, and the, like I said, the political headwinds are in their favor. Ron and others are working for organizations that are pushing this. We're getting um, the media is getting a push from all these um, national gun safety groups every day. Um, there is a huge public affairs push right now. Not that, to say that that's what makes anything go, but. It's helpful. I believe that they're on TV. I think there's digital ads. So this is the final push. The lame duck session is in January, early January. Um, and so they're hoping to pass this. And as I said, it looks like it's going to happen unless, um, say, the senators or other people kind of point out, hey, we don't like this one part. Or what if people say they don't want the FOID age limit in there? Um, that has been a sticking point for years. So we're still trying to see a little bit of if, whether people want to tinker with the legislation. Ron Holmes. You know Springfield like the back of your hand, so you know you are part of Protecting Illinois, the Protecting Illinois Committee. So tell us, this is, is what is this? Is this an independent expenditure committee? What is it? What are you trying to do, and how? Sure, Protecting Illinois Communities is a C4 that's organized um, a conveners table of folks that um, have been big voices and traditional voices in the gun violence prevention space, but as well as community voices. Uh, as everyone knows here, uh, the NRA is a very organized and powerful force. 
so this group was kind of convened to make sure that, you know, we can not only do the paid media that Tina referenced earlier, but also grassroots organizing, as well as provide a lobbying presence to help members uh, not only be educated on the bill, but also feel comfortable back in their home district. Well, are you whipping it? What, what's on the back of your envelope? Yeah, so I mean, we are early, as Tina said, and I think that the first bill that you've seen is is basically a draft in Springfield terms, right? So there are ongoing stakeholder meetings to change and tweak language to uh, accommodate um, different constituency groups, but also make sure that there are no unintended consequences. Certainly, I, you know, Tina reminded you that this is a product of the housework group. Uh, there is still work to do over on the Senate side. So while these hearings are happening, and we're hearing very powerful testimony from people uh, that are ravaged by everyday violence, there's also going to be a process underway to make sure that Senate uh, colleagues are also comfortable with this language or might have additional tweaks. So in the Northern Illinois, this is an easy, uh, will probably be an easy vote for most people. But uh, Dave, can you tell us the bigger picture? You know, it's one thing to say, I always say supermajority Democrats, but not all Democrats are the same. In your analysis, what are the distinctions when it comes to a gun package between Democrats in the state house? Well, I mean, it used to be uh, when when Democrats actually held office downstate, these gun issues were, I, I think, more complicated because uh, you might have somebody at the far southern tip of Illinois. Uh, they they you, you know it's almost kind of a religious experience when deer hunting season begins in, in parts of Illinois. And, and, you know, families come together around that and it becomes a whole thing. And so, you know, any talk of, of doing anything with gun laws is uh, kind of viewed rep as repulsive to, you know, to, to people there. And so I, I think that's an issue here now that, that downstate is largely Republican and getting more Republican, uh, it makes it a little easier, I think, to pass these kinds of bills. Uh, and, and, you know, look, the fact that on July 4th, is, is Lynn, as you know, you were a, 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 you observed it, uh, the, the Highland Park massacre that, uh, that, that unfolded. I mean, we have, uh, you know, one of these mass shootings involving one of these weapons that, that it could be regulated that was used it, happening in the collar counties. And the collar counties are where where elections, statewide elections get decided in Illinois. And I think, you know, that's a factor. Suburbanites, by and large, are, are in favor of tighter restrictions on these types of weapons. And I think that's, you know, that that drives the narrative here in, a, in, in large part. I think it's going to be an interesting thing as, as it unfolds about, you know, what 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 do they settle on in terms of penalties here? Is it a felony to uh, to possess one of these items? I mean, that in past gun control debates, that always has been kind of the fly in the ointment. Um, but, you know, one one other little footnote here in, in the, the package of legislation that I've seen, um, you know, there there's a, a pretty innocuous resolution that Representative Morgan put on the table as well. I believe it's in, in committee here that uh, just simply honoring the victims in Highland Park and honoring the first responders and and praising the, 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 the village for the way it responded to July 4th. And I was looking at that the other day and, you know, just in terms of the witness slips that were entered on this resolution that doesn't advocate gun control in any way. There were more than 300 people who were listed as opponents to that. And it's, it, 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 it boggles the mind how anybody in, in our society could be against a resolution like that. Well, especially since Bob Morgan represents Highland Park in the state legislature. So that's if people are wondering, why would he take that extra step to include it? It's because, uh, those are his constituents, though. So, uh, Eleni, super minority Republicans who represent the Southern Illinois turf that Dave's talking about, what and how is the response, do you think, evolving and developing from within the Republican House Caucus? And what do you see happening? So I think, you know, as Dave said, this is a very sensitive and important issue to downstate Illinois. And I think what we need to what we need to look at is more not not about when this or or if this is going to pass, but when is it going to pass? Because there's two options here now. You can either they can either pass it in the lame duck where you have 
uh, unfortunately now a handful of House Republicans leaving uh, who would be more willing to take a controversial, well, in their eyes, controversial vote to make this bill bipartisan? Or do you wait until the next General Assembly where, you know, you don't need any uh, Republicans to vote for it and you can give all the new freshman Democrats a win on passing an assault weapons ban? So I think I think that's probably the biggest thing, as we said, with super majorities. It's not, you know, it can they pass it, but, you know, when are they going to pass it? And I think it's really part of their strategy right now is they're trying to figure out, you know, do they want it to be bipartisan? So, I mean, I would guess it would be very helpful for them to make it bipartisan. And I think that they would probably probably see uh, more Republican votes on it if they were to pass it in lame duck. Well, that's such a shrewd statement. I had not realized that because I know in Washington, uh, Democrats call something bipartisan, and Republicans have too, if you just get one member of the opposite party. But for the, so do you think of the lame duck state house Republicans that there are some who would be willing to vote for this? Absolutely. I absolutely think that there are. And I think, as we said earlier, you know, in the, in the suburbs, you know, we've lost the cycle, a lot of House Republicans. And, you know, those folks are probably at this point in a lame duck, more willing to take a controversial vote uh, that maybe they would not vote for if during an election cycle, if they were still in the still in the mix. So I think that that's definitely something that Democrats are looking at. And, you know, they probably, it's, in my opinion, would be in their best interest to make it a bipartisan bill. But it would give a, a talking. It would it would be a way of explaining it in a more uh, in, in in turning down the heat. What is going to happen to Illinois Republicans in the wake of the midterm? And maybe start in the state house, which you know the best. We have new leadership there. How do they maneuver? What do they do starting next year? What role do they play? So it's going to be very difficult. Um, you, you know, now we've lost a handful of House Republicans in the suburbs and collar counties. Uh, we're going to have a new leader, uh, Tony McCombie, who's uh, in the Quad Cities. And, you know, she's, you know, kind of been a bridge between the divides of the caucus. Uh, but the caucus has shrunk and has swung much further to the right now. And so you know, our, the best bet for her is to continue on with Leader Durkin's almost mantra of working with others on the other side of the aisle to get important things done for the state. Now, she's going to be in a difficult position because many members of her caucus don't feel that way. And so the first step is for her to try to unite the caucus uh, once again and start moving it forward. and you know, the Senate's going to have to do the same. They also have new leadership now with John Curran, who is a suburban Republican, which is great for the party to have a leader uh, still in the suburbs. But the party is really just going to have to find ways to unite over the important issues that we can find compromise on uh, with Democrats, because right now, you know, we saw an election cycle where it most of the time was spent with inner party fighting that ultimately resulted in a disastrous midterm. And so we, we really need to see uh, Republicans unite across the board in the state and focus on the issues that they can agree on and, you know, make that, make those the platform that they want to fight for to get, you know, independent voters to look their way, because that's, that's key, as we know, in Republican politics for wins in Illinois. Well, I know that Illinois Republicans met a few days ago and, you know, the leadership stayed intact. Uh, and I know that the downstate block, one of the leaders is Chris Miller, the state rep who's the husband of Congresswoman uh, Mary Miller. You know, they said, don't blame us for the GOP losses here. Um, before we move on, Eleni, is that analysis one you agree with? We're, we're the candidates who ran uh, weren't, and, and their positions weren't the problem? Uh, no, I don't agree with that uh, analysis from them. I think 
uh, what we saw was in the prime in the Republican primary for governor, uh, we had J.B. Pritzker spending millions upon millions of dollars to ensure that Darren Bailey would get elected, because, as we said, suburban and the suburbs in collar counties are where you need to win if you're going to try to go for a statewide office. You have Mark Kirk, Bruce Rauner, Judy Bartopinka. Uh, those were not, you know, conservative uh, voices. And so, again, these folks need to start focusing on how to win and focusing on issues that resonate all throughout the state and not just in the areas that they represent. Because J.B. Pritzker, like I said, spent his millions to put Darren Bailey at the top of the ticket. And that race was called in, what, 35 seconds? I don't even know what the exact time was that the AP called that race. And because of him, you know, we saw destruct because of his name and what he stood for, we saw destruction down the ticket. So I do not agree with that analysis from that group. So, Ron, as you know, Democrats have been criticized for supporting and normalizing uh, candidates backed by Trump, the MAGA Republican wing of the party. Do you think this should be a one and done tactic as we now are ready are starting to talk about 2024 and, and the Democrats? who lost the House in Washington, are looking to reclaim it, would, would, would Yeah, you look, I, I, I hope um, much like Eleni that we don't have another Darren Bailey uh, elevated to uh, the top of the Republican Party. I, I don't think that it's good for Republicans or Democrats, quite frankly, to have that as a choice. Um, look, I think moving forward, um, and this has been indicated, uh, you know, I've, I've said all along that Darren Bailey was one of the best things that happened to Democrats last cycle. And the reality is, um, if Republicans want to make gains uh, during the next cycle, because, you know, every member of the House is up in two years, uh, and there are some suburban races up in two years, um, the thing that they were dragged over the head on time and time again was guns and choice. And I think ultimately, you know, this assault weapons ban gives them an opportunity, not just the lame ducks, but also, you know, folks that are going to be in that caucus moving forward the opportunity to show that there's, you know, some separation from, you know, the Darren Bailey type politics. Uh, and then, you know, again, like we've already seen some Republicans um, that are retiring, uh, talking about the Republicans platform on, on choice itself. Um, you know, so like we're going to see a, a change in the dialogue. The question is, you know, how does Leader Bacambi and, and Leader Curran kind of, you know, move their caucuses to where they need to be, especially in the absence of statewide leadership? Interesting. So before we move on to the Chicago mayoral race, uh, Tina, we'll have a little different dynamic in Springfield coming in. You have a Speaker Welch who now has been around a few years and is uh, more established and experienced in his position. But we're going to have as a Secretary of State, Alexei Giannoulis, who will be more activist than Jesse White. Uh, we, we know he came out of a bruising campaign. Uh, his campaign advisor, Hannah Trebe, is joining him as a deputy chief of staff. I would imagine he will take a higher profile than uh, Jesse White, just in that he will be heard from. Uh, Tina, how do you think that will change the mix, if at all, having Alexi in statewide office? It is 100% a political resurrection for him. We're all watching to see what he's going to do next. I believe that there was a forum during the primary where the candidates were asked, you know, will you use this position to step up to higher office? And I think he was the only one who would not say that. So we all believe that he will try to do something in the future. I think there will be a spotlight on him. I think people will be watching, but it's also because Jesse White led that office for decades. And we, I mean, we've seen some changes, but now you have a younger person who likes the spotlight, who's going to make changes. So I do think that's going to be kind of a fun thing to cover next year to see how he kind of revitalizes this office that is kind of a boring office. It can be. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how he changes that up. So Dave, will Alexi in a sense challenge Welch as the uh, elected face of Illinois Democrats, well, you know, intentionally or unintentionally? Well, I mean, you, you know, I would argue the face of Democrats in Illinois is J.B. Pritzker. Uh, and and sorry, and, sorry, sorry. You know, and, and so I think I think with Alexi, you know, to pick up on Tina's point, um, 
you know, this office historically has been a springboard for other people. I mean, you you can look back to the days of George Ryan. He he uh, enacted the or uh, helped push the uh, effort to lower the state's drunk driving threshold to 0.08. Went on to become governor. Before him, it was Jim Edgar, uh, two terms as Secretary of State, and then he he went on to serve as governor. And before Edgar, uh, for the old timers, Alan J. Dixon from Bellevue, oh, yeah. who went on to become U.S. Senator. So the the history is there for an office that is really one of state government's, you know, biggest prizes because of all the jobs that exist there, the contracts. Uh, and and it, it does oddly, and Tina's right, it is a boring office until you need to, you know, go in there and, and get a, a new, you know, license sticker or something. But um, it, it, it's an office that, that can kind of uh, touch people's lives in certain ways. We all need driver's licenses. We all deal with organ donations. We all, uh, you know, uh, uh, are interested in, you know, state history and stuff. So, I mean, uh, Alexi has a platform to run on, but he would be wise to kind of focus in on, on, you know, spending a year or two kind of getting that office reshaped in the way he wants it and and coming up with results. Because he made a, a lot of promises on that. And I just so everyone knows, I know that Governor Pritzker is the top Democrat in my mind, which you cannot read. I was thinking of the category under that. So Anne and everyone before you call me, I know this. So uh, just I was slicing and dicing in different categories. Ron, what do you think will be uh, the dynamic then in a new session? Also, by the way, the next biggest prize that people will be waiting for is to see if Senator Durbin decides to run for another term. Uh, and then, of course, what happens in the 2024 presidential race if uh President Biden decides not to run, but with these unknowns out there, just having some new blood in there with Alexi, how does it mix things up, if at all, Ron? Look, uh, Alexi's never been shy about the things that he wants. And, you know, I, I think that he, you're going to see him all over the state. Um, and also, you know, again, I, I think that there's some merit to it being a boring office. Let's not forget how Jesse White came into office. Uh, so sometimes boring is good. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, look, Alexi's going to be out there. He's going to travel the state, um, just as we've seen uh, Speaker Welch traveling across the country. And also just as we've seen Senate President Harmon, who's also relatively new to his gig as well, uh, travel across the state with their, with their colleagues. Look, there was a time in Illinois politics where the Democratic Party of Illinois chairman uh, couldn't show up in certain districts. Uh, I think we have a statewide ticket that is prepared to go anywhere in the state, talk with constituents put their arm around state reps and state senators without those reps and senators uh, freaking out that it's going to wind up in a mail program at some point. Right. And Eleni, didn't Gina Lewis already reach out to, what is it, I'm blanking on the report. Well, Dan, Dan Brady is a member of Alexi's transition committee, yeah. and I, I think so the committee is one or the other. How do you interpret that? Is a significant olive branch? Yes, but I think it, there's no question that Alexi has aspirations for a higher office. I think he always has. And I think that uh, I just wait and see what he decides, which office he wants to go for. And like you said, waiting to see if Durbin uh, decides to run for another term, I think that will probably determine, you know, what his next steps are uh, for his future. And by the way, it is Jim Durkin who once ran for Senate, who would seem to be at the top of a Republican list for Senate if there is an opening. Moving on to City Hall, big race, latest development is that Paul Vallis, Cam Buckner, and who am I missing, is attacking um, Chewy Garcia on the cyber donations given to him directly and through a, um, through a Sam Bank Friedman super PAC. But Tina, could you just set up the state of play right now and where you think the uh, mayoral race is, who's, you know, who's doing what and how. Yeah. Um, last time we talked, we talked about Chewy Garcia getting into the race and how the dynamics were a little bit different than they were before when he ran just in terms of the union split. Um, but you are seeing some of the factions moving around a bit more since he's announced and you are seeing more support. Um, Brand Spielman just wrote about a poll, Local 150, we take union polls with a grain of salt because they've commissioned it, but he looks to be ahead. So we, we are seeing um, the unions pick and choose where they want to support him 
And um, you're seeing some other people as well. I think Paul Vallis is getting some business support um, and some of the more conservative support. So you're going to see how much of that is left. We don't think that there's a lot. So no offense to the conservatives, but conservative support in Cook County and Chicago, which we saw in the um, general election. But that's money. So we want to see how the money kind of um, what happens with that money. I think that's the interesting narrative of Chuy Garcia, the union support, how that's going to work and also how the money race plays out. Right. And he is for the first time getting significantly, significantly beat up early because if he wants to portray himself as the front runner by putting out a, a poll, then this is what you reap now is that you have three candidates, uh, you know, Lightfoot, Butner and Ballas beating up on him. Uh, but the other point, oh, the other thing, speaking of money, the American Federation of Teachers, they pledged a million dollars. Has anyone seen any of it actually reported? No, yes. So, Ren, you are running, could you tell us you are involved in another uh, third party effort dealing with the city council elections? What is it and what do they want to do and who's the money behind it? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think there's been a lot of attention. Uh, rightly so, pay to, you know, who is going to be the next mayor or remain mayor. Uh, but there's also a ton of turnover uh, that's happening in city council races. There's been a record number of, of re uh, resignations and retirements. Uh, there's a number of open seats across the board. So with all of that, um, um, Get Stuff Done PAC has been formed specifically to make sure that the city council reflects the will of the majority of Chicagoans. Um, I, I think that it's very easy for us to kind of uh, focus specifically on the mayor's race and then look up and have a council that uh, continues to point fingers at each other and you know uh, can't get stuff done. So you know our goal is to make sure uh, that we're supporting candidates that are going to continue moving the city forward uh, regardless of who the mayor is. Well, this sounds like you're going to put together a slate and and give them donations. Is that the plan? Or will yeah. you do a party? Or yeah. you intend to third party? Uh, uh, campaigning for them. Yeah, so it, it's there will be a process, and I mean, so because we're getting way into the weeds here, but we're going to do a poll, uh, and then we're going to have a questionnaire that uh, candidates will be able to fill out, uh, and then based on those uh, responses, we'll determine um, which races we want to go into pre-runoff, right, and then which races um, you know we'll go to after the runoff. I mean, there's there's just so much uncertainty with. Um, some of the automatic races at this point, you know, you want to see who the viable candidates are in these open seats. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll sit back in some of these races. But I think for now, I want to say, like right now, the way that the field is stretched in terms of open seats and retirements, like two thirds of the city council can possibly go to a runoff. So, um, you know, we're not going to try to, you know, spend what will be a seven figure pack um, in a month here. We'll, we'll try to, you know, make sure that we're there for Candidates that have tough runoffs as well. Who are your funders? Yeah, so there'll be a mix of business and labor and then just traditional Democratic donors. Um, I, the budget right now, I think we've got pledged um, somewhere around over a half million dollars that should be in the bank in the next couple of weeks here. Uh, and then we'll probably get, you know, north of a million or so, uh, probably in, you know, 30 to 45 days. Who are your major, can you name the unions and the individuals who are- Yeah, so the great Unlike the other packs that I've worked on, you will actually be able to see uh, some of the donations on the State Board of Election websites uh, once we actually report them. So um, that, that is a commitment that we've made to kind of do it this way. Um, so that, again, I think uh, constituents and the aldermen themselves or automatic candidates know exactly like who's funding um, some of the mail and digital activities that we'll be pursuing. Eleni, you're a, let's say you are a Republican in Chicago. What's your play here? Who do you look at? Who seems most interesting? And you want to vote? I think, you know, we haven't seen a one candidate take the lead necessarily. That is just, this is the person. We all want to back this person. You know, Chewy just got in the race recently. And we're just now seeing, you know, the negative come out on him. And this is just getting started. And so it's going to be interesting to see how negative uh, people go or his opponents go on him and what else is out there. Uh, and then that poll that 150 did that's backing Chewy, you know, one 
tidbit out of that that was interesting is that, you know, Paul Vallis was in third place. And I think that that shows that there are still a lot of players in the mix here. Uh, and this isn't, you know, Chewy's our person, you know, everyone's just running behind him. And the union uh, divides will also be interesting to see how they all shake out as well. Do you think a Republican, this is officially a nonpartisan race, so mm-hmm. it's up, Chewy is one of the most liberal members of Congress. He's to the left of the left of the left, wherever you, how far left you go, he's, he goes where his votes are. Do you think that's relevant if you are a Republican or is it really will be an issue thing? And if you like a platform on crime, you don't care or you will disregard because it's officially nonpartisan what the voting record is? I think that that plays some role in people voting. Uh, I think Republicans or Democrats, I think that this last election cycle, and maybe even before that, you know, we've seen both parties shift to extremes on either side. And I think what you're seeing is a lot of people, regardless of party affiliation, that live in Illinois, or even other states are kind of looking for people to bring us back to the middle a little bit. And uh, I think that being a Republican or a Democrat in the city uh, of Chicago is not necessarily going to make or break you. I think right now the biggest issue is crime, as we also saw in that poll. And I think that most Chicagoans really are looking for someone who can do something about this. And I think people are scared, as Tina mentioned, you know, the shootings that have been happening. I mean, they happen every day, sometimes outside your front door. I mean, it's it's a weird and different time that we're in right now. And I think most Chicagoans, again, regardless of party affiliation, are just looking for someone that can offer some sort of concrete solutions to this problem, because that's what's affecting them every day. So, Jay, Mayor Lightfoot has been beat up every day for years now. She has. We're talking if she had two big uh, wins in uh, this week in the city of from city council where she had uh, the casino legislation passed and uh, the red line extension. That's a really big, big deal. She has a top-notch campaign team in place. No other candidate has the professional team in place that she has. Uh, Her media consultant, Eric Edelstein, is, is the firm that just won the Georgia Senate election with Senator Warnock. Uh, do you, you know, you've looked at the, the, the big picture here, Dave, uh, is Mayor Lightfoot in as kind of a fragile position as that poll may suggest, or is that just a ephemera for the moment because Chewy's never really been attacked? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, Lightfoot has, uh, not, shall we say cultivated relationships, uh, kind of the way traditionally you've seen relationships be crafted between a mayor and a city council. I mean, look, in in previous administrations, the city council was kind of a rubber stamp. I would argue having a little conflict between a mayor and a city council is a healthy thing uh, for city government. Um, But at the same time, that, you know, kind of raises questions like, again, on relationships, you have to have them to put together coalitions. And I think that, um, you know, yes, those are big uh, wins for her and the casino and and uh, the red line extension, although I think the red line extension is going to, you know, it, it will take a lot of time still to pull that together. Um, but, you know, I think uh, I, I think for her, you know, the, the, the issue still is this crime uh, issue. I mean, we're down, uh, I, I heard earlier, I mean, we're down something like 1700 people in the city police department. There needs to be some sort of concrete plan to you know, get this, the, the police department up and running again in an effective way so that there can be patrols. I mean, you know, you live in neighborhoods uh, that, that uh, you know, that, that traditionally there have not been big crime problems, but there are now carjackings and, and armed robberies and, and, and uh, home burglaries and things like that without any kind of, uh, you know, real response. So I think that that's kind of what I think a lot of voters in the city are going to be looking for from all of the candidates about what what is the plan here to stem 
this this crime wave that seems to be running over the city. And I think whoever comes up with, you know, a feasible plan that appeals to people, you know, they're they're they, they may be in good shape. So that that is, does anyone here have any idea that is, yeah, and, and this is why life puts on the defensive because this is all happening on her watch. But uh, do we have agreement as we close this out that at this point there is a top tier of candidates and a secondary tier that may not um, really last more than a few weeks as viable candidates, or do you think people will actually drop out? Let as we close down, let me kind of do this as our parting thought as to this field will have people drop out or some people will just uh, be candidates in name only. And let me start with Tina. Sure. And then we'll, come from here. well, let's look at four years ago. Like I remember talking to Lori Lightfoot the Sunday before the election and she was the underdog and she was kind of like telling me about a clash song that she was listening to. And it was like a very sweet, like casual interview. Like I didn't, I do not think she knew what was going to happen. And so you just never know, especially with this huge group of people. I do think there will be people who will not be able to get union or money support or anything else who will just stay on the ballot for name recognition for whatever they want to do in their future. But you just I just think this is so unpredictable at this point. Absolutely, because in the early polls, she was like what life it was like three percent or something. Right. Now, Eleni, what do you think is the. Uh, I agree. Uh, I think I agree with Tina. I think you know, there are going to be some folks that end up, you know, just staying on the ballot just to stay on the ballot. Some folks may drop out. Uh, but I do think, it, you know, right now we have a first tier, a top tier of candidates, but who knows in by February 1st, what that, that tier is going to look like. So I think we're going to see a lot of things, you know, changing uh, as we get into January and campaign mode really kicks in and all the campaigns that plan to, you know, fight the fight are going to come out strong in January. And we'll reassess then, I guess, where who's in the top tier. And we might we may not know until that very last week or the day before. Mm -hmm. So who's the top tier now, Dave? What do you think? Well, I mean, you have to you have to count uh, Lightfoot, of course. She's got the advantages of incumbency. Uh, Chewy Garcia, I think, is 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 the other one. I mean, the, you know, if the two of them are in a runoff, um, I, I think it would be as reporters, it'd be a very fun election to cover because they're both seasoned campaigners. They know they know how to appeal to people. And, you know, you go back in time and like uh, the, the dynamics here are a little bit different. I mean, when when you know, Rahm Emanuel, in, in, you know, with the whole Laquan McDonald thing, the, the, the way that that was handled, the cover up and, and just the violence, the, the, the video that we all saw, I mean, it torpedoed his political career in a way that, you know, Lightfoot isn't facing that kind of existential threat. Um, and, and so she has these these other issues, crime, as we mentioned, uh, the, the, the economy in the city, um, you know, various things like that. But but I think she's she's uh, in a in a halfway decent position. But Chewy Garcia, I would never count him out. I mean, he is a, he, he is a seasoned campaigner. Uh, he, he's a holdover from the Harold Washington days, uh, knows how to put coalitions together, has union support. Um, so I think the two of them right out of the gate have to be considered that Vallis, he's, he's, he's kind of on the fringes, I think. I mean, Paul has, uh, certainly knows city government, uh, ha having spent as much time as he did with CPS, but, but I do think that, you know, he's, he, he's kind of, uh, there, there's this, he, he's been in so many elections at this stage that, uh, you know, that. I, I think there's a fatigue almost maybe associated a bit with Vallis. He's not a fresh face. And the last word we'll have from Ron. So Ballas and Lightfoot and Chewy all have records that they could be attacked on. Willie Wilson has no record. He's run multiple times. What is the Willie Wilson factor as we close out this edition of At the Table, Ron? Yeah, look, if Willie Wilson stays on the ballot, uh, there is a considerable chunk of folks that are willing to vote for Willie Wilson, regardless of what whatever he says over the course of this campaign. I think we've seen it from his last couple of races, um, which makes the question or begs the question of why are there so many um, a black elected officials running in this race? And also, like what the path is for, you know, some of the other black candidates when you have Lori, when you have Willie on the ballot certainly something to watch over the next couple of months. And with that, really smart comments from everybody. 
this is this has just been uh, I'm honored that you all came today for this discussion of what's happening in Springfield and Chicago. Thank you for joining us at this edition of At the Table.